Great. Thank you, Margie. So during our afternoon session, we will continue discussing about geochemical cycling across the land ocean continuum, but we will be focusing on uh, the Arctic system. We're going to have two talks by Lee Cooper and Joel Rowland, and then we will continue with uh, a panel discussion. So first, Lee Cooper um, will give a talk discussing freshwater fluxes into the Arctic, discussing river inputs, as well as um, melted ice okay. right. so and the Bering Strait. And I turned this thing off, so I should be, I should be live. You can hear me? Um, thank you very much to the organizers for the chance to make this presentation. We, we talked a little bit about, well, what would fit in with this uh, theme and the coast or the uh, land to sea uh, theme that we're uh, dealing with today. And um, I came up with the idea, I wanted to talk some about uh, freshwater fluxes uh, uh, into the Arctic Ocean and all of the evidence that it's increasing. Uh, and so there's no place, uh, first you want to talk about the rivers in the Arctic, and uh, when you want to talk about the rivers in the Arctic, it's best to go to Russia, uh, uh, because that's where all the rivers are, the, or the big rivers are, and I'll show you that in a minute. This is uh, uh, the Severnaya Divina River uh, uh, from Arkhangelsk. Uh, I had a chance to go there last month, and. Uh, took this picture. Uh, Arkhangelsk is a city of about 350,000 people at about the latitude of Nome. So it's another difference with the North American Arctic is there actually are a lot of people live in the Russian Arctic. Um, and this is a, a port or before St. Petersburg was uh, developed by Peter the Great. Uh, uh, it was the major Russian port to the outside uh, and was important even until World War II with the land lease. Uh, um, this is a big river. Um, uh, it, the annual uh, discharge is greater, significantly greater than the Nile, um, the uh, Missouri, and the Rhine, the three, uh, three examples from three different parts of the world. Uh, but when you uh, go to a map of, uh, I'll do it that way, uh, of, of, uh, of the Russian Arctic, and you look at the sizes of these rivers, and these are uh, in cubic kilometers uh, per year in terms of the, um, uh, the, the Severnaya Divina is actually about the fifth or sixth biggest river in the Russian Arctic. Uh, the Kolomov is about the same size, and then the Lena, the Yenisei, the Ob are all several times the size of, uh, of this river uh, in terms of, and then the two North American rivers that we'll talk a little bit about are the Yukon uh, and the Mackenzie. Both are, are uh, big rivers, but uh, if you look at the whole um, uh, system in terms of the, and what I've got on this is a, is a chart of discharge, um, annual discharge, combining all of the rivers. So these are the six uh, Russian rivers, uh, and they're on, plotted on this scale here, so they're in red, and the, and the Mackenzie and the Yukon are actually plotted on, a, on another scale on the right. So you can see that uh, the Russian River influence on the Arctic Ocean, about three percent of the world's ocean water is in the Arctic Ocean, and about 10 percent of the fresh water flow into the, uh, um, into the world ocean goes into the Arctic Ocean. And it, if you recall from this slide, uh, the proportion of continental shelf to deep basin is much higher in the Arctic Ocean than any other uh, basin. So this is the one dominated by fresh water flow, and, uh, um, uh, and, a, and it's a very estuarine system. So the point of this slide, and Max Holmes, who works up the road at the Wood, Woods Hole Research uh, Center, uh, is, has had the lead on uh, the Great Rivers Observatory and partners before that in terms of charting the chemistry of these rivers and their inflow, uh, as well as the discharge and getting that publicly available. And you can see that there's an upward trend in both of these. So I think this is pretty well established, and we've known this for about 20 years, that um, um, taking into account dams and reservoirs and um, the uh, seasonality of these rivers, uh, there's still uh, a, um, uh, an increase in the amount of fresh water that's flowing into the Arctic Ocean. So those are the rivers, the big rivers, unless you think about Bering Strait. So keep in mind these numbers up here, we're at 23, 24, and 800, 750. If you look at Bering Strait and you consider that the deep Arctic Ocean is mostly Atlantic water, has a salinity of 34.8, um, and you look at the water that flows through Bering Strait, 
it's actually the Bering Strait, the freshwater that's entrained in that is the biggest single freshwater source in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, and Rebecca Woodgate, uh, who's monitored the Bering Strait for the last 25 years, uh, and Canute Agar before that, um, published this paper last year, which of course you can't see it, but it's in progress in oceanography, uh, demonstrating this increase. The, the main point I'll make here is just this increase, uh, 2,300 cubic kilometers in 2001, and her estimate is 3,500 uh, cubic kilometers, so a huge increase of about 50%, uh, uh, and this is based again on this, this uh, Arctic Ocean salinity. Now, one thing I would just say about this, um, this system, when we look at this, uh, where, where I took this picture, um, we're right at the U.S.-Russian border, which is between these two islands. So this is Little Diomede. There's a, a U.S. community there. This is Big Diomede, or the Russians call it Ratmanov Island. And then that's, uh, in the distance, uh, Cape Dezhnev, the, uh, the easternmost point of Asia. And in this light of sight, and then behind us, of course, is the other half of the strait. It's 85 kilometers across, so we're in the middle of the strait. And looking back behind me, uh, back to Alaska. Uh, in this line of sight, there's, there's no monitoring at all uh, right now. Uh, I'll show you on a map, but I thought it would be helpful just to put this illustration up, that this, it, it's 50 meters deep, so it's not, it's not deep ocean, but the whole strait, uh, even between these two islands, is 45 meters deep. So it's, it's a big channel, uh, and the monitoring of the, these estimates involve a lot of interpolation. Um, and this is what it looks like. This uh, A1 mooring hasn't been operative for several years, and the reasons have to do with U.S.-Russian relations. Uh, and then so Rebecca's got a mooring here that was kind of behind me where I took that picture. And then there's another one up here right at the U.S.-Russian border that she's trying to catch the stuff that's coming through the, the Russian side. And that's uh, significant because that's where all the nutrients are on this side. Uh, and this is fresh, uh, the, the Alaska Coastal Current, it's fresh water. And the other thing to point out about this is these moorings, uh, strictly speaking, they don't do that good of a job of sampling the top of the water or the surface of the water where all the fresh water is. And so I got to thinking about this um, in, in terms of uh, stable oxygen isotopes. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, but first uh, I just wanted to demonstrate what the structure of the Arctic Ocean is. And I think somebody showed a slide similar to this. But essentially, we're talking about going from Bering Strait over to Fram Strait. And the Pacific Ocean influence, and this is an exaggerated scale. It's 4,000 meters here, but that's 800 meters. So um, it's exaggerated at the surface here. Uh, so the Pacific influence is in this halocline layer here. And this halocline is also where the nutrient maximum is. So if you go down to 33.1 salinity in the Arctic Ocean, um, you will find the highest nutrients, uh, silica, nitrate, phosphate, uh, and that's all water that's come through Bering Strait. Um, and then below that, most of, most of the Arctic Ocean is really Atlantic water. And one thing I would, uh, when i talking about oxygen isotopes, so uh, delta 18, the delta 18 value of the upper ocean I, halocline, so in other words, if you went down to 33.1 salinity, um, what Robbie McDonald and uh, and Brenda Eckwurzel uh, followed up, uh, used this, uh, this tracer and came up with a, an end member tracer um, composition of that upper ocean, upper Arctic Ocean halocline of about a delta 18 value, about minus 1.1. And so if you actually go to Bering Strait itself and collect uh, water samples back and forth, you'll see that minus 1.1 would be up here and 33.1. It's only in the winter. Uh, that you actually see water that, that kind of meets those characteristics of minus one. And, and the reason is, is that that water passes through Bering Strait and then it becomes salinated uh, as it goes across the Chukchi Shelf. So it, it has a, a, a signature of Bering Strait, but when it goes through Bering Strait, it doesn't look like that 33.1 water. So it has, salt has to be added to it. Uh, and then you, this is a, a least squares regression line drawn through uh, all of these data, but you can see there's some outliers. And, what they are is melted sea ice if you go this way. So at certain times of the year for a short period of time, uh, in June or May, you see uh, melted sea ice in the surface waters going through Bering Strait. Uh, and most of the rest of the year, most of the rest of these are water that's had brine ejected. And so that brine continues. So that's why 
the actual water that goes through Bering Strait doesn't look like the uh, uh, upper Arctic Ocean hailcline. Um, but you can do these sort of um, end member uh, regressions. And if you draw this line all the way out to zero salinity, it has an, uh, a freshwater end member of about minus 19 or minus 20. Uh, and that's what the Mackenzie River is. The Bering Strait inflow includes Yukon River water. Uh, so it makes sense. Uh, they're they're both, both similar rivers in terms of the freshwater end member. And also, of course, uh, all of that water that's in the North Pacific that's got a freshwater signal in it. Um, and so what you can do with that, and this is, these are data from um, Shelf Basin Interactions Program, and so these are samples were collected in the Chukchi Sea and in the Arctic Ocean proper, is that if you have reasonable end member analysis, if you say, well, Atlantic water has got a salinity of 34.8, and it has a delta 18 value of plus 0.3, and then you draw a line all the way out where you think that freshwater end member would be, which would be about minus 20 and a salinity of zero, um, you can see that that line doesn't really work very well uh, because that's the line we'd expect if there wasn't brine injection. So almost all the water we see uh, in the Chukchi Sea in the Arctic Ocean has had brine injected into it. Now, if you go the other direction, and these are two different cruises. One was in May, June, so those are the circles. The triangles is when we came back and the ice had melted. Then in some samples, in surface water, you'll see a little signal from melted sea ice. But I think the main point I'm trying to uh, bring here is the Bering Strait inflow and the rivers are the big story and probably melted sea ice, which has a salinity of four uh, and, a, um, and an 018 content of maybe <clears throat> plus one, um, that that's not that big of a signal, but you, you can detect it. And you can, using this end member analysis, uh, come up with estimates for both the runoff fraction and the sea ice melt fraction. So we've done that in surface waters, and I'll just show you a few examples. Uh, uh, this is a cruise uh, 2017 Arctic Marine Biodiversity Monitoring Program, so it's really a biology cruise, but we collected surface water samples. And what you can see, the, uh, uh, the fraction of sea ice melt, the only place that we saw any was here, and there was some, some sea ice hung up here in Kotzebue Sound that probably ended up here. But most of the rest of this is almost negative uh, melted sea ice. So the melted sea ice signal is very ephemeral, uh, at least in these shelf areas of the, of the Chukchi Sea. And uh, here's another example. Um, this is from a low, uh, low sea ice year, same year, 2017. We were out there from July till September, and we never saw a piece of ice the whole time uh, sampling in this whole area. So the big signal is river water at the surface, probably some Mackenzie or some other uh, river water that uh, that showed up here in the areas that we can really define. I'm not pretending that we've got enough uh, information there east of there, but that's just what what uh, what the the mapping does. And then finally, here's another example. Uh, this is from uh, last year, uh, and we did see a little ice. So when you have a little ice, then you can see the sea ice melt signal up here north of Barrow, and also still a river signal. And then there's a lot of river water coming through Bering Strait. And Kotzebue Sound also has, uh, has a lot of river runoff. So you probably got the idea that we go up there a lot. We collect a lot of water samples. There's, uh, and so um, I got to thinking about 018 and this minus 1.1 number that it's supposed to be. And it doesn't turn out it's that simple. And you've seen some of the examples from <coughs> the Bering Strait um, uh, area. So what I'll show you, what I'm going to go through, and, and the purple colors are the more recent, the green are the oldest. So we've got some purpled here, we've got some green up here. So there's a mix of years. It's from 1987 um, to uh, 2018. Uh, uh, if you take out all the water samples that are shallower than 100 meters, so uh, we do see this sort of salinity of 32.5 to 33.5. So this is water parcels that have the right salinity. If they have a little more salt added to them, they might settle out at that 33.1 uh, salinity. Um, and these were also ones collected on the shelf. They might be water made in the winter that's got some brine in it, and it's stuck on the shelf, and it will wiggle its way off and fall off the, uh, the slope and then settle out at 33.1 salinity. So I'm just going to work my way through this and show you. I'll start with this slide, because this shows the 1,300 data points. Uh, for salinity from 32.5 to 33.5, uh, 
Um, there are three points here from 1987. This is the canonical definition of that halocline water. It's supposed to be 33.1 and minus 1.1. And you can see from the get-go that there's a lot of noise in this. And there is some isotopic, a slight isotopic fractionation uh, involved with when sea ice forms. I'm giving a big spread of the salinity because we're really looking for 33.1 salinity. But I'll work my way through it. The orange colors, when they show up, are going to be the most recent. And you'll see that happens in about 2010, something like that. So this is sort of a, a walk down memory lane, 1990. This is how you also get 40 slides in a 20 minute talk. So 1995, we went to Ru we were in Russian waters for part of this. Uh, 1999, this is a winter cruise, or we were out there in March on the polar sea, another uh, winter cruise in April. Uh, this is shelf basin interactions, first year, the second field year. And then 2008, uh, 2009, and I think ice scapes, which 2010 and 11, you start to see the orange colors uh, predominate. And so what's happening here is this, uh, these orange colors are showing up a little more negative than they were. And I've got to get through this so I can come up to the current date. Anyway, you can see, um, and I'm still working out how you statistically show this. Um, but the, the O18 content of that water with that salinity has become more negative over the last decade or so. Um, and if you look at, if you, if you follow up with the assumption that um, that number is still the same, we, we think the snow and rain that falls in the North Pacific and on the Yukon River Basin and everything still is minus 19 point, or minus 19.3 or something close to that. Um, and the salinity is still 33.1. If you go down there, you're going to see that Bering Strait influence in the high nutrients. Um, you can just do a simple um, end-member mixing model and look at what's the percentage change. So let's just say for the sake of argument, we're going from minus 1.1 to maybe minus 1.6. That's a 45% increase in freshwater flow. Rebecca Woodgate's mooring data says it's a 50% increase in freshwater flow between 2001 and 2014. Um, maybe both of these numbers are wrong, but it, I take it as a good sign that they're, they're pretty close to each other. So what are the consequences of this? We've already seen some slides about how much permafrost there is uh, in the northern hemisphere. Um, and so this is, this is something that's of crucial interest um, because there's plenty of evidence that the organic carbon that's tied up in permafrost in northern hemisphere. There's a picture from Alaska, a slump uh, right in the Selawick River. That's one of the rivers that flows into uh, Kotzebue Sound. <clears throat> I got this picture from uh, Vladimir Romanovsky. I think it was taken quite a few years ago because he's got more gray hair now, but um, it is along the Coloma River. Coloma is the biggest river in the world that's completely underlain by permafrost, but you can see maybe it won't be underlain by permafrost too much longer. And it's an older picture, at least a decade old. Uh, and then if you look at where is the organic carbon that's in soils, you can see that some of these soils, as been pointed out in pr prior talks, uh, has a very high burden of organic carbon in it. So um, when we look at, and then another way of looking at this too, is this is some other shelf basin interactions um, uh, data looking at, well, you can, you can do salinity, but we always like, O18 because it's not as affected by brine injection, so I get a better I get a better picture here with O18 versus uh, um, a DOC. These are Bering Strait samples collected on that summer cruise versus the spring cruise before the ice had melted. So the runoff picks up, and you see this DOC signal going through Bering Strait itself. Um, and it's been pointed out in in uh, one of the lightning talks and earlier. There's a lot of fresh water that's piled up in the Beaufort Sea, um, in the Beaufort Gyre. And this is an older um, uh, diagram from two th published in 2006. And it's only become a, a much more fresh water that's stored. And so the kind of the holy grail, I think, is people think about, well, what if all that fresh water spills out immediately into the North Atlantic? And what are the thermal hailing circulation um, implications of that. I'm not sure I'm ready to go down that road, but I think we can, we can definitely say, uh, in looking at the conclusions, clearly fresh water in the Arctic Ocean is increasing. That's going to increase stratification. 
Uh, we are getting it both from rivers and Bering Strait. Sea ice melt, not as big of a deal, uh, even though the sea ice is melting and generating other fresh water. There's potential for impacts on the North Atlantic. Um, and increasing dissolved organic carbon, and that's from all of that land runoff, I think. And, the, and I haven't mentioned uh, 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 the LAPTEF Sea, about half the organic carbon that's getting dumped into the, into the LAPTEF Sea is coming from coastal erosion rather than from, from uh, runoff. Um, so those are the big picture uh, stories that I wanted to uh, get across. I want to thank um, everybody who helped me get all those water samples. Uh, and then I, I have some professional help uh, with the math spec now and some of the maps you've seen, uh, Alan and Jackie, uh, we've worked together for 30 something years now in the Bering Strait. And then over that whole period of time, a lot of agencies have stepped forward, not all at once, but we'll take, we'll take them from wherever we can get it, when we can get it. So thank you, and uh, that's my talk. Thank you. Great talks. Uh, you talk about uh, coastal erosion and uh, permafrost, but do you know what's the extent of subsea permafrost and what's the um, impact of subsea permafrost for, uh, in a sense, well, it's melting also and for the in input of uh, dissolved inorganic carbon? And yeah, I think, I think it's possible that we'll see some impacts from that. It's um, all of the continental shelf in the East Siberian Sea, the Chukchi Sea, some of the uh, um, uh, Beaufort Sea is, is underlain by, by subsea permafrost, and it's been there since the last glacial maximum, and it's been locked up. Um, there's some evidence, of course, that the East Siberian Sea in particular, that there's some degradation of that and release of methane. All right, well, thanks again. <laughs>